Brexit is to me, it's a terminal illness. And we've got to show everybody else, this is bad for you. We can't move forward as a country, as a people, unless we scrap it. So anyway, that's enough from me. I'll introduce you to our distinguished panel. I love watching their stuff on YouTube. It does put me off a bit that he's a scouser. <laughs> hey, nobody's perfect. And in fact, I'm old enough to remember when, as a Man United fan, we hated Everton more than Liverpool. <laughs> it's Graham Hughes, three men in a... three, three blokes in a pub. Wait, let me choose the resume before you go. <laughs> He's going to do his speech, but he can't wait, can he? Greyhounds in the traps, is that Shakespeare? And then in the middle we've got uh, Mike Dugan, who's a professor of uh, EU law. University. One, of, one of those experts, you don't need to hear from experts of course do it, and uh, on the end there you've got Madeleine Kay, a warrior for the EU, the EU supergirl, which is going around everywhere. Fighting the fight because it is, a, and again, you know, fuck Fenny Oak here as well, you know, I love all his stuff. Because I follow all these people online, they become new heroes to me. Uh, but we're going to start off uh, with hearing from, let's hear from a professor first. Don't worry, he is, from, he is in Liverpool now, not from Liverpool. Uh, from Belfast, in fact, uh, Professor Mike Dugan. Thanks very much, and um, um, thanks very much for the invitation. Obviously, to come over uh, to come over to Manchester. Um, uh, I've got a bit of a dilemma because when Dominic invited me, he said maybe you can talk either about the Irish border problem or about uh, general Brexit stuff. Um, and so what I did was I did both, and I thought, well, well I'll let you decide. So um, I've got a quick show of hands. Would you like to hear about? a sort of detailed academic discussion of the Irish border problem, which will be very educational, and I'm assuming will be useful, given that it's the main issue which is in the news a lot these days, it might be useful for you as campaigners to know a bit more about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. or would you like, as an alternative, my general sort of checklist of why Brexit is such a contemptible disaster <laughs> and a stain on humanity? Politics Festival next weekend, so I quite appreciate to have some background knowledge for Okay, uh, Irish Okay, well quick show of hands, Irish border. That's quite a lot. Um, Brexit general disaster shite. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite so much. Irish border wins the day. <laughs> okay. Um, Irish border talk then. Um, I think that, that first of all, uh, just, just by way of background, of course, we need to remember that, that although the attention is focused on the Irish border, the Irish border is only one of the major challenges which is facing Ireland, North and South. Um, everybody, everybody agrees that Northern Ireland, of all the parts of the UK, is going to be most damaged by Brexit, come what may. Everybody deems, uh, agrees that of all of the member states of the EU, the Republic is going to be most damaged by Brexit, potentially even more than the UK itself. Um, it's just a total disaster. But it is the, 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 the border question which is um, the most pressing, the most difficult, um, the most difficult to, uh, to solve. Now, of course, the latest fashion in leave propaganda, and it's only the latest fashion, is to deny that the Irish border problem is actually a problem. You probably have seen Sammy Wilson stand up in front of the news cameras and say that this is just being made up by the EU as a way of punishing the UK, that it's made up by Remainers to try and keep the UK tied into the single market, the customs union. Of course, that's absolute rubbish. Everybody who has two brain cells to rub together, and therefore excluding <laughs> Sammy Wilson, <laughs> knows, that, knows that this is a serious challenge, a very difficult challenge. Now, it's worth reminding ourselves briefly what, what the nature of the challenge is. Of course, it's an economic challenge. If you're going to erect physical frontiers for customs and regulation between the North and the South, you're effectively destroying agricultural and manufacturing bases in both parts of the island, which are heavily integrated, heavily dependent on supply chains. It's partly about the social disruption. Do you need me to all stand up? But then I won't be able to see my notes because my eyesight's so shy. <laughs> um, shall I I'll prop myself up and go like this? It's very good for my posture anyway. Um, 
social disruption. Uh, obviously, if you live in one of the border communities, which is suddenly going to find life much more difficult, um, it's not very desirable. And of course, the sheer logistical fact that you've got over 200 formal crossing points between the north and the south, you physically cannot erect and police and enforce 200 border crossings across such a tiny territory. But most of all, of course, it's the, it's the physical manifestation of the border, which is of potential political significance and catastrophe in Northern Ireland. Um, I obviously come from Belfast, so I know the place very well indeed. Um, and part of the genius of the Good Friday Agreement, and it is a genius agreement, is that it manages to convince both unionists and nationalists that they've won. And in, in Northern Irish politics, it's all about making people think that they've won. Mm. The unionists have won because for a very long time, the foreseeable future, Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK, and it, pretty much everyone accepts that. But for nationalists, they've won, because it doesn't really matter that much. The only thing you notice as you travel across the island of Ireland is that the signs change from miles to kilometers. And apart from that, you can basically pretend that you're part of a united Ireland if you really want to. But, the absence of the physical frontier, then, is, is desperately important for economic, social, logistical, and political reasons. Now, it's not helped, obviously, that Northern Ireland and its politicians are incapable of forming a meaningful um, administration to, to run the territory. Um, and, and Brexit was only ever going to make this worse. Regardless of the border question, Brexit was only going to make it worse. But of course, the border is simply pouring oil onto a fire. Now, it, we have to be honest with ourselves and, and realize that, of course, these concerns, while they may appear obvious to me, to you, to most of the people in this room, they are not universally shared across this country. You may have seen the research that was published in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago that suggested that well over, well over 80% of English League voters believe that a collapse of the peace process in Northern Ireland is a price worth paying for their beloved Brexit. That is an utterly shocking statistic. The idea that well over 80% of English League voters, that's about 15 million people, believe that civil war in Northern Ireland would be worth it in order to deliver Brexit is a shocking statistic. So these are not universally shared concerns. Um, nevertheless, what was always going to be a difficult position has, of course, been made far, far worse by the stupidity of the Theresa May government in simply promising totally undeliverable things to different groups of people. We're going to leave the single market and the, and the customs union, therefore we're going to have a, a border between the UK and the EU. Everyone knows that. But we're not going to have a hard border in Ireland, we're going to ensure that there's no return to the border in Ireland. Okay, how do you do that? That means that Northern Ireland has to remain within the customs union and the single market, even if the rest of the UK leaves. But we're not going to do that because we're not going to treat Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. How do you do that? By the whole of the UK staying in the customs union and the single market. <laughs> Just back to the start of the circle again. The government's position is completely inane, totally incompatible, thoroughly incompetent and or dishonest, probably both. Uh, of the problem. Now, when I say the problem, of course, I mean that's the nature of one of the 20,000 problems that we have to deal with, but it's the problem that I'm talking about right now. What about the solution? Well, here I'm assuming that most people in the room know about the joint report, the joint report of 2017, all of these obscure legal documents that suddenly get thrust into, into the limelight. And you probably know, of course, that the UK government is pinning the, its hopes on the idea of solving the Northern Irish border problem simply as part of the overall future relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, the problem is, of course, that the UK government is completely incapable of coming up with any credible proposals for what that overall future UK-EU relationship might look like. The Checkers plan, if any of you are particularly interested, I did a little video on it um, in Liverpool a few weeks ago to point out just how rubbish it really is. But, 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 but everybody knows that it's unworkable, let alone unacceptable to a large part of the, of the UK Parliament. But it's, it's simply unworkable, it's not deliverable. Now, whatever the UK government hopes, I'm sure we all know that they've committed to the backstop, a legally binding backstop, that regardless of what else happens, regardless of what might come, there will be no hard border in Northern Ireland. And of course, th this is a genuine possibility. The backstop, Theresa May loves to pretend that it's just some theoretical thing that, might, that will never be used, it will never come into play. That's absolute rubbish. 
on any realistic assessment of the UK situation, the backstop is the most likely outcome of what will have to happen at the end of this transition period that she's negotiating. So this isn't a purely theoretical thing. It is almost certainly um, got to be designed to be workable and deliverable because there's a significant chance that it might actually need to be used. Now, as you probably all know, the EU's proposals for the backstop is that basically Northern Ireland should remain within the customs union and significant parts of the single market. And that does mean, of course, that there will have to be new checks between goods travelling between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Uh, we all know that the UK government is totally opposed to this. It says that it's completely unacceptable. Um, and, and, and it talks in these increasingly apocalyptic terms as if the entire UK as a state is about to spontaneously <coughs> combust if the EU decides to check the quality of horse semen on a ferry between Scotland and, and, and Belfast. Um, that is the nature of border checks, by the way. That's not, that's not you have to get your hands dirty. That's the wrong um, phrase, I said. <laughs> Now, the UK government's only opposition, the only argument that it can come up with is Northern Ireland cannot be treated differently from the rest of the UK. Now, of course, across the whole of Europe, they raise an eyebrow and say, but surely Northern Ireland is already very different from the rest of the UK. You have different rules on abortion, you have different rules on marriage equality, you keep talking about letting them have completely different taxation systems so as to uh, compete with the Republic. Of course, Northern Ireland is treated completely differently from the rest of the UK. But nevertheless, that is the, the, the UK government's position. Now, right, let's finish then with the most recent developments, what has actually happened over the past couple of weeks. Well, on the one hand, the EU has basically said, we are prepared to soften the visibility, soften the visibility and the impact of new checks between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So, so we, but they have to be there, we still have to check things, we still have to levy our tariffs, but we'll make it as unobtrusive and un, unvisible as possible. The UK government, uh, for its part, has still failed to, failed to publish any more detailed or more credible plans for the backstop itself. But what it has suggested is that, first of all, the backstop shouldn't be just about Northern Ireland, the backstop should cover the whole of the UK. So this is no longer about solving the Irish border problem as a problem. It's about the whole of the UK being tied into the customs market and uh, the customs union and the single market. But that can't be an indefinite situation. The UK must be able to terminate it. The UK must be able to stop the backstop. Now there are various problems with the UK government's approach, and this is probably uh, the bit which is most important for you as campaigners. So as when people ask, you know what these problems are. The first problem, of course, is there just isn't enough time to do this. The EU has basically said it has taken you nearly two bloody years to get to this point, and you're still totally hopeless. What makes you think we're going to agree such a complicated and controversial thing in the space of two weeks? It's just not credible. So we can talk about a UK-wide backstop, but we still need to have the Northern Irish-specific one because there simply isn't time to do anything else. The second problem, of course, is that the oh, UK... Hang on. Hang on. Oh. Save it because uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, listen, uh, Professor Michael, we'll, we'll hear more from him. Uh, but Andrew Adonis has managed to make.